Good morning. Hi, good morning all. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good morning. Good morning. I hope good morning. I, I hope everybody enjoyed the Easter holiday, the Carifta games, and all of that good stuff. I know you guys probably didn't partake because you were diligently studying for the CFP. Am I correct? Okay. Oh, uh, I am going to start out the, uh, this class and another class, so we're going to really be on the move. Is there anything anybody else questions about so far that they would like for me to rehash? <coughs> A pleasant good morning, Mr. Latrell. Um, I have a question. Um, I've been trying to practice um, the sample problems. Yes, ma'am. Um, I don't know if you remember the one where it was number three, when we were trying to solve for N and we kept getting an error five. I've been trying to solve that and I'm still getting the error five. I see the answer. So I don't know if maybe it doesn't have to be today because I know we have some things we have to go through, but probably if you could just walk me through step by step. Not a problem, Candris. Uh, I will make a point to reach out to you during the course of the week, if I may, <clears throat> and I will step through that problem with you step by step. Okay. Thank you. Not a problem. You can always also. Please send me an email in case you get on without me. I have my email address as well as my phone number. Send me a WhatsApp to create a time slot. You and I can quickly jump on and go through it. Okay, I am always here for you guys to meet you because it's a lot of information to cover. My module is not the only module you have. I empathize with you guys, okay? Um, in terms of trying to get it sorted out. Uh, having said that, I think during the course of this week, I sent you out some uh, information, so to speak. Uh, did everybody receive it? I gave you guys information on a new bond offering from the Bahamas government. I also sent you guys an information on the court offering. Did everybody receive it? Um, I received both, but I couldn't get the one for the port to open. Um, I was able to share the one for the government, but I'm having a challenge. I, I don't know if you have any connections there, but I had purchased some 
bonds um, several years back and the account had closed and I've been trying to get them to change the number for me to get my funds, but that never worked out. So I don't know if I want to purchase anymore right now. No, when you say the account came, I, I'm at a loss. Who was the account came? My well, that particular account that I had, um, closed, and so they asked me to provide them with um a new account information. I provided them with the information, but no one never responded to me. I've already sent them about three emails, but to this date, no response. That's another thing. Oh. Okay, out of this class setting, yes, I do have some contact with the Stanford Bank. Uh, my question is, so where they been sending the interest? But anyway, did it as it may. Anybody else got anything else as it relates to this class? No. Where is the young lady who works for C5? Hello, C5? Is that Ms. Major? Hello, Ms. Halea. Okay, who works for C5? That would be me. Ms. Halea. Hi. Uh, Ms. Halea, sorry to put you on the spot, but as you, you know, when I send stuff out, uh, I've had a lot of inquiries. Uh, and I see that the court offering is like a minimum of 50,000. Uh, do you know that if a person has a brokerage account of C5, if they can buy less? And if you don't know Mr. Lear, please say, I don't know Mr. Donovan. Um, they normally pull, they normally have an omnibus account. Yes. Yeah, so it can be, it could be done if you show interest, if you're interested. Okay, what about outsiders who may not have a a, a brokerage account? Um, no, I'm not too sure about that. Okay, fair enough. You've answered my question. You're pressing one now. I think last time we stopped at uh, looking at uh, products. Um, in terms of when my screen reset itself. Uh, I, we were we were going through fixed income products, uh, and today I'd like to continue uh, with other types of products. Uh, again, I've already asked anybody had any questions on what we've covered so far. So I guess if not, you guys know uh, what we are uh, uh, comfortable with what we talked about so far. Uh, so I'm going to skip ahead to uh, uh, equity security. Uh, equity security, uh, in case you don't know, is basically uh, fixed income security for bonds is when a person loan money to a company. They raise capital by borrowing in the form of a bond. A bond is a, a, a borrowing contract. Uh, you have a specific amount borrowed, you have a stated coupon rate, uh, and you have a time frame of which it is being borrowed, and you have uh, what is going to be the payment cycle. So when you buy the bond of a government or a company, you are making a loan to them. Now, this is in contrast to when you buy stock of a company or shares of a company. When you buy shares of a company, you are now participating in the ownership of the company. You're not a lender, you've actually You've actually given them money in the form of buying a share in the company ownership. Uh, preferred, as I say, preferred stock is a class of ownership in a corporation that's ha that has a higher claim on the assets and earnings than common stock. There are several types of stock. Preferred stock and common stock. So when you buy preferred stock, 
you are a claim ahead of the common stock universe. However, please note that the last people to be paid over the year, if a company winds up, is the owners or the equity holders of the company. Preferred stock generally has a dividend that must be paid out before dividends to common shareholders, and the shares usually do not have voting rights. Double of things. As opposed to common stock, are units of ownership of a public corporation. Owners typically are entitled to vote on the election of directors and other important matters, as well as to receive dividend on their holding. In the event that a corporation is liquidated, the claim of secured and unsecured creditors and owners of bonds and preferred stock take precedence over the claims of those who own common stock. I, I encourage you to know the salient feature of these products, bond, preferred stock, common stock. Those are questions we will see coming up. Okay. Key ratio in terms of stock, what's been the 52 week high or low? Year to date change, the dollar change in the share price during the year since December 31st. The year to date percentage change, the percentage change on the share price since December 31st. Market cap, the share price multiplied by the total number of issued and outstanding shares of the company. Shares outstanding, what is the total number of issued and outstanding common shares? No, total number of shares that are outstanding and available for trading by the public. Short interest measures, what are the orders for this stock? Total number of shares that have been sold short and have not been repurchased to close on the short position. Beta, the covariance of the stock in relation to the rest of the stock market. In other words, what type of relationship does a stock, does this particular stock have with the movement of the stock market? When the normal stock market goes up, does this stock go up or down? And if so, by how much? Uh, some, believe it or not, some companies, when the rest of the stock market is going up, they have an inverse relationship because people run to the stock uh, as a shield, such as utility stocks and so forth. Uh, so there are, stocks have their own personality rather than individuals. Key ratio, dividend yield, equals the trailing, 12 month dividend, dividend divided by the stock's price. Earnings per share equals the trailing 12 month net income divided by the total number of issued and outstanding shares. Price to earnings ratio equals the price per share divided by the EPS. PEG ratio equals the price to earnings ratio divided by the long-term EPS growth rate. Dividend payout ratio, the percentage of net income paid in dividend. So you got all of these little salient things. I could very well ask the question, what is the dividend yield on an equity? You would have, and you would see it in a multiple choice form. Uh, so be familiar with what are the salient features of each one of these products. Examples of key ratios, I will leave that to you guys to wait to wait to. If you have any questions, please let us know. Now, derivative product. Derivative product, mutual fund. Fund operated by an investment company that raises money from shareholders and invest in its stock. Mutual fund, I'm sure everybody knows. Basically, when you invest in a mutual fund, a mutual fund is just a fund that takes its money and invests 
in an array of trust that any one individual by themselves would not be able to invest in all. It would take a tremendous amount of capital to invest. What you can do instead is buy shares in a mutual fund. All you got to understand is the concept of a mutual fund. There are two types of funds. There is an open-ended fund, a type of mutual fund where there are no restrictions on the amount of shares the fund will issue. In other words, as the fund grows, it can issue more shares. If the mine is high enough, the fund will continue to issue shares no matter how many investors there are. Open-end funds also buy back shares when investors wish to sell. Open-end funds are generally managed actively and are priced according to their net asset value. Some open-ended funds are more conservative and provide consistent returns with low risk, and some are more aggressive in seeking the more capital gain through constant trading. Close and the fund. When an investment company issues a fixed number of shares in an actively managed portfolio of securities, the shares are traded in the market just like common stock. So you got open ended. Where a, where a mutual fund, if there's enough demand, can keep on issuing shares. Or close ended, they issue a set amount of shares. They don't issue any shares thereafter. What are the advantage, advantages of mutual funds? Professional investment management, diversification, liquidity transferability, variety of types of funds, transferability between the funds of a given company. In other words, how, how CFAR, CFAR has several types of funds, money market funds, a bond fund, and equity fund. Uh, normally, what you can do is I can tell somebody if I'm more interested in a money market fund, hey, Take some of my take some of my money out of the bond fund and, and switch it to the money market fund. But that's only because it's with CFAR. You can't do that if you are a Royal Fidelity mutual fund and a CFAR mutual fund. You cannot do that. That can, that transferability between the funds of a given company is only if you hold, hold funds in both types of funds or in that one company. Disadvantages of mutual fund. Unsuitable for short-term investment. Because when you invest in a mutual fund, if you want to liquidate all of it, it takes some time to liquidate all of it. Unsuitable as an emergency reserve. Professional investment manager is not infallible, believe it or not. In other words, even the professionals would call it work. The key features of exchange traded funds, real estate investment trust, and hedge funds. Exchange traded funds, ETFs, a, a fund that tracks an index and can be traded like a stock. ETFs always bundle together securities that are in, an, are in an index. Investors can do just about anything with an ETF that they can do with a normal stock, such as a short, such a short selling. Because ETFs are traded on stock exchanges, they can be bought and sold at any time during the day, unlike most mutual funds. We are priced will fluctuate from moment to moment just like any other stock's price. And an investor will need a broker in order to purchase them, which means that he or she will have to pay a commission. There are no sales loads or investment minimums required to purchase an ETF. 
The ETF universe has expanded significantly over the last few years as investor demand for exposure to global markets has increased. Today, investors can invest in ETF and rest, represent a basket of stocks listed in indices in China, Eastern Europe, Asian emerging markets, Latin America, emerging markets, et cetera. Can anybody give me an example of an ETF? Felicia. Yeah. Can you get uh, ETF that comes to mind. Can you give me one? Anybody out there? Hi. The SBDR. Now, when you're using these acronyms, you gotta be, you gotta remember not everybody uh, is familiar with the acronym. What does the SBDR mean? Oh, um, I still use to use an acronym. I, I, um, I understand. I understand. Um, SBDR is one of the oldest um, ETFs on the market. It's normally known as Spider. Mm -hmm. Um, it stands for standards and pours depository receipts, from what I can remember. There you go. What you are doing, you are buying an index that's a standard and poor. Obviously, standard and poor has bundled together a certain type of, 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 of equity and is selling them as a bundle. And they're selling them as if they're an ETF. They trade them. It's not a mutual fund, it's an ETF. Um, well, do you realize the Dow Jones Industrial? Can, you, can they say, go in and buy so many shares of the Dow? The Dow, the Dow Jones Industrial are an ETF. Mm -hmm. They are industrial stuff. All right, so, uh, but thank you, Paul. Hedge fund, an aggressively managed portfolio of investment that use advanced investment strategies such as leverage, long, short, and derivative position in both domestic and international markets with the goal of generating high returns with low, lower volatility. Uh, legally, hedge funds are not often set up as private investment partnerships that are open legally. No, let me start. Legally, hedge funds are most often set up as private investment partnerships that are open to a limited number of investors and require a very large initial investment, minimum investment. Investments in hedge funds are often liquid. They often require investors keep their money in the fund for a minimum period and provide redemption quarterly or normally. Uh, in Lord Joe Fear, you, you discuss LTC and so you are aware that despite them in the hedge fund carry significant risk. Normally, hedge funds are not normally traded are not publicly traded companies. They are what they call part of private partnership investment. Uh, they don't have to register with the SEC because they're private. They normally require investors to be what they call high net worth investors. All right, uh, and you have to prove this to them. In other words, you have income of at least $250,000 a year, or if you are married, a combined income of $300,000, and you have assets like of a million dollars separate from your home. So hedge funds are not, they're telling you hedge funds, hedge funds are 
uh, for a certain type of investment. We can put that money away and afford to leave it there for a little while. Understanding options. The two key types of options are the American option, option and the European option. The American option allows the owner to exercise at any time before or at expiration, while the European option can only be exercised at expiration. Uh, a call option. An arrangement that gives an investor the right, but not the obligation, to buy a stock, bond, commodity, or other invest instrument at a specified price within a specific time period. Guys, options are very intricate things to understand. I don't expect you to understand, but I do expect you to understand what types of options there are and, and the little nuances about those options. Take the instance, the call option. The major, Sophia. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good. Uh, a call option in reading that description of the call option, what stands out to you? Um, that you can buy it at a specific price, no matter what the market price is. Right. Um, and it's your and you you I'm, but you're not obligated to do so. You Bingo. Bingo with me. If I buy the option, I bought the option. It gives me the option, but not the obligation to buy it. That's what I was looking for with me. You hit the nail on the head. Those are, well, I could ask the question. A call option is an agreement to give the investor the right, the right and the obligation to buy a stock for. Now I would tell you. Is this a correct statement? Obviously, Ms. Major, what, what type of statement would that be? Uh, false. Why? Because it only it it doesn't give you, I mean, it's not an obligation. It's a choice. That's, fire. That's correct. Right. You got it. You got it. Whereas a put option, an option contract that gives the owner the right. In other words, I got the stock but not the obligation to sell a specified amount of an underlying security at a specified price within a specified time. Okay, Benetra, Benetra, are you there? Hi. You, you, you have gone missing for a little while. Anyway. Oh, I didn't, you was calling my name earlier. I didn't hear you. Benetra, me and you, Benetra, me and you, to enter into a put option. I got five shares of cable. Cable now trading at $10. I sell you a put option. Yeah, so look at the new truck. I'll sell these cable behind the shares to you. It's now $10. And it's twelve dollars. I'll tell them to you twelve dollars is now is now uh April. I'll give you a December put option where I'll sell these cable behind my shares to you at twelve dollars. Uh, uh, yeah, that's an option now. It's an option. I get and I and I'll I'll you have to pay me a dollar for the option. So if you buy that option from me, that put option, that's a put option, I've just put this to you. What are, and you do buy the option, what are you expecting the shares of Gabriel Bahamas to do? You said the shares is $12? It's now $10. 
It's ten dollars. Right now, today, when I'm putting this to you, I tell you, I'll sell you a put option for a strike price of twelve dollars. In other words, in in December, uh, I, I I'll sell it to you twelve dollars in December. Okay. Uh, uh, but uh, you got to pay me a dollar for it, for the put option. Now, if you were to buy that from me, right? What are you expecting the price of? Cable Bahamas to be. If I'm buying it from you? Yeah. Would I expect Cable Bahamas price to be? Yeah. Or what do you how do you expect the price to be in between now and December? Like 14. Okay. What she is saying is she if she were to buy it, she's optimistic about the price. She believes it can go up and it can go up higher than $12. Mm -hmm. okay. And I got to go up actually to thirteen dollars because she got to cover the dollar. She got to pay me for the option. Mm -hmm. uh, now she will obviously exercise exercise that if it if it does go up. So if it goes down, I, I have no right to sell it to you. I didn't know not that she was going to buy it. So just be familiar with these things a little bit. Okay. All right, forwards and future. Forward. Uh, so, so I, I just want to clarify with, with the put option. Even if she agrees to purchase at a certain price, she doesn't have to buy it. No, no, I don't have price. to sell it to her. You don't you don't have to sell it, which means that if the price increases way more than expected, you, you still have the option not to sell at the price as agreed on, 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 on the sale date. I got the option to put it to your uh let me tell but let me put it to you this way. I have the right to put it to it, right? Uh but I have not I don't have the obligation to sell the and that you are asking if it goes up above the twelve dollars, if it goes up below, I understand what the, the dilemma may be for. An option contract gives the owner the right. Now she is the owner. An option contract. She owns the option contract, right? And so mm -hmm. I need to that. So she has the right. To call that from me if it goes above 12. I'm sorry, I got it the other way. You're right, Dimitri. When she buys this option, she has the right to buy it from me at the $12 if it goes above. You got that, Dimitri? Yes, sir. If it goes down, she got the right. Not the exercise, of the, it don't make no sense for them as the exercise of the drill, right? Mm. I mean, okay. if the stock goes down to nine, Dimitri, you there? You, you, you went back on mute. Go ahead, sir. Sorry. Yeah, if the stock goes down to nine, there is no obligation on her behalf to exercise it. Am I making sense to you? And if it goes up to 14, she still has the right. The, the, the seller still has to sell her. The buyer. The buyer. The, the, buyer, the buyer still has 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 to um keep true to the to, to the previously agreed sales price of, of, of 12. Has, the buyer has the right to call the contract in the mm. Oh, okay, okay. So so she has the right to call the contract in the ah. mm. Okay. Oh, well, that makes sense. Okay. Yes, sir. And you see how tricky it gets. You see how tricky it gets. Now we can complicate it a little bit more forward and future contract. Mm. 
-hmm. forward contracts of private agreement between two parties and are not as rigid in their stated terms and conditions. Forward contracts are private arrangements between two parties. Let's go back up to options. You can trade options on the market. Unlike a forward contract, that's between two individuals. Because, for, because forward contracts are private arranged agreements, there's always a chance that a party may default on its side of the agreement. A cash market transaction in which delivery of the commodity is deferred until after the contract has been made. Although the delivery is made in the future, the price is determined on the initial trade date. Most forward contracts don't have standards and aren't traded on exchanges. Good question right there for me. Our forward contracts trade on an exchange. For all of the following types of contracts or derivative contracts are traded on the screen. Call options, put options, forward contracts. Two or four. Three, uh, so these are, the, I don't, all that I was, forward contracts is a private agreement. They're not traded on the screen. Futures. A financial contract obligation obligating the buyer to purchase an asset or the seller to sell an asset. Notice here, future, a final a financial contract obligating the buyer to purchase an asset or the seller to sell an asset, such as a physical commodity or financial instrument at a predetermined future date and price. Future contracts detail the quality and quantity of the underlying asset. That's all I need, you have to read the rest. Futures as opposed to options, futures as obligation. Options are rights and not obligations. Everybody got that? Okay, we're gonna get into fundamentals of portfolio management. We get in a lot of material. Yes, sir. Does anybody have any questions that would like for me to go back over any other thing? Okay, fundamentals of portfolio management. All right, now you've learned a little bit about the types of financial products out there. So now you have to determine what of these products am I interested in? Now, normally what you do, and this is what, you know, when they talk, when they tell you it's the CIFP, Certified, Certified International Financial Planner. All right, now here's the client coming to you. Miss Hilaire. Miss Hilaire. Oh, Miss Elaine. Paula, are you here? I'm here. Paula, I just hit the lot. Got me a little bit of money. We're in about half a million dollars. I'm now 35. Don't have a house. Got two kids to wife. My kids are like 10 and 11. Paula, what should I do with this money? Um, well, that depends on, well, you're 35. So you have good ways to go. 
Um, so you can take on a little risk. So I would recommend that you split it, um, some in a mutual fund, since you have kids. That's a long-term in investment. Purchase some bonds and probably invest the other half in some international security. Like what? You mean you want me to list off the different securities or? They can be major classes of securities with international security, US security, European yes. security, South American security. I would probably go with US securities, so probably some US treasury bonds, um, and probably some private companies. You have some good tech companies out there. And that's where I would direct you to. All right, now, well, thank you very much. This is what you would have paid for to get a certified internet. International financial planner. You would have to sit there with a client. And basically, what you're trying to do, only one thing, I only one way I would solve for them. Never once did Paula ask me, well, what is it that you want to accomplish, Mr. Guy? She told me what she would have done. And Paula, I'm not picking on you. I'm not picking on you, Paula, please. And thank you for the active participation. Never once did she ask me, well, Ms. Gordon, do you have any life insurance? Are you covered in that way? In case you take the bucket. Uh, what are you looking to do? I mean, uh, what type of investments interest you? Is there an industry? Are you partial to technology? All these things have to go in where you sit down and you interview the potential client. It isn't what you want. It's what's best for the client and what suits their goal, their risk appetite. And we will try that time. Well, are we still friends? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Asset allocation is the process of deciding how to distribute, distribute and invest as well among different countries and asset classes for investment purposes. An asset class is comprised, that y'all got to me. I am I, I, I mean, well, quite aware of this happening. I gotta give you the one. So basically, what you're trying to do is help assist the client in structuring their portfolio of investment to meet their particular goal, bearing in mind if what are their where are they in their life cycle? Starting over with age and so forth like that. One of the basic things you see listed here is insurance, particularly life insurance. And it says life insurance should be a component of any financial plan. Number one. Because one weird thing about the future, it is not predictable. And what they are saying to you is have a plan. So that if you do, if something happens to you before you accomplish your goals, there is a plan in place that you leave behind your state or the individual uh, that they have something. Life insurance protects loved ones against financial hardship should death occur before our financial goals are met. The death Benefit paid by the insurance company can help pay medical bills and funeral expenses and provide cash that family members can use to maintain their lifestyle, retire debt, or invest for future needs. Sports retirement, children's education, etc. Therefore, one of the first steps in developing a financial plan is to purchase adequate life insurance. 
Or y'all can even, y'all know that question, right? What's one of the first steps in portfolio analysis? The major, what's the first thing you're going to do when you run into this money? Um, purchase life insurance. Well, make sure that you have adequate life insurance. Life insurance, right. Okay, because you may already have life insurance. But when you run into this big bug, run your money, your lifestyle changes. Insurance can also serve more immediate purposes, including being a means to meet long-term goals, such as retirement planning, on reaching retirement age, you can receive the cash and surrender value of your life insurance policy and use the proceeds to supplement your retirement lifestyle or for estate planning purposes. Guys, does everybody have a life insurance? Let me know. That's one. That's none of my big when you decide with life insurance, please do your own research on the type of life insurance that you buy because they have life insurance sales agents out there. They may, I'm sorry, great industry is structured. Their main thing is to meet their quota. Of some of the life insurance, they're trying to get to the round table. And they may sell you the wrong type of life insurance. It happened to me before. So there are types like term life insurance, has no cash flow in the value, probably no best, best benefit. The only purpose that, that serves is if you want to put it against a loan or a mortgage bank inquiry in the event that you meet an untimely demise before that mortgage is the insurance company and pays it out. So what you may have is a term life insurance specifically for that purpose and then a whole life insurance that is there designed for your uh, beneficiaries upon uh, an untimely demise. You can choose among several basic life insurance contracts. Term life insurance provide only a death benefit. The premium to purchase insurance changes every new renewal period. Term insurance is the least expensive life insurance to purchase, although the premium will rise as your age, will rise as you age to reflect the increased probability of death. Universal and variable life our policies, although technically different from each other, are similar in that each provide a death benefit and a savings plan to be insured. The premium paid on such policies exceeds the cost to the insurance company of providing the death benefit alone. The excess premium is invested in a number of investment vehicles chosen by the insurer. The policy's cash value grows over time based upon size and purpose. Um, please use other products like universal and variable like please, if you're thinking about them, how somebody explain them to you in depth. Okay. Another component of a portfolio cash Reserves, emergencies, job layoffs, and unforeseen expenses, and good investment opportunities emerge. It is important to have a cash reserve to help meet these occasions. In addition to providing a safety cushion, a cash reserve reduces the likelihood of being forced to sell investments at inopportune times to cover unexpected expenses. Most experts recommend a cash reserve equal to about six months living expenses. Most experts recommend a cash reserve equal to about six months living expenses. Most experts recommend a cash reserve equal to the six-month living expenses. I've read it three times. So I got to tell you, 
with the expect. Calling it a cash reserve does not mean the fund should be in cash. Rather, the funds should be an investment you can easily convert to cash with little chance of a loss in your value. Money market mutual funds and bank accounts are appropriate vehicles for the cash reserve. Similar to the financial plan, an investor's, an investor's insurance and cash reserve needs will change over his or her life. The need for disability insurance declines when a person retires. In contrast, other insurance such as supplemental medica Medicare coverage or long-term care insurance may become more important. Assuming the basic insurance and cash reserve needs are met, individuals can start a serious investment program with their savings. Okay, so to get these two out of the way, the insurance and the cash reserve, got them out of the way. Now we can start looking a building an investment portfolio of other types of financial assets. Because of changes in their net worth and risk tolerance, individual investment strategies will change over their lifetime. Although each individual's needs and preferences are different, some general traits affect most investors over their life cycle. So you go into this, this is a very good graph. Yeah. They are basically an accumulation phase, a consolidation phase, and then in your retirement years, a spending phase. Uh, so uh, each phase has a description, it's pretty self explanatory. During your more productive years, when you are young, you are building, you are in your accumulation phase, you are accumulating assets, uh, so forth like that, consolidation. Now you're looking at long-term retirement, short-term vacation, children, and so forth. In the last phase, you're, you're now at retirement, keeping up your lifestyle, and maybe making a number to your grandchildren and so forth. Okay, so they go into the scribe each phase, which I'm not going to read to you. Uh, just the basic description of the phase is pretty self explanatory. Then we want to go next is the portfolio management process. The process of managing an investment portfolio never stops. The process of managing an investment portfolio never stops. It's a dynamic process. Once the funds are initially invested, according to the plan, the real work begins in monitoring and updating the status of the portfolio and the investors' needs. The first step in the portfolio management process is for the investor to, to construct a policy statement. The first step in the portfolio management process is for the investor to construct a policy statement. The policy statement is a roadmap. In it, investors specify the type of risk they are willing to take and their investment goals and constraints. All investment decisions are based on the policy statement to ensure they are appropriate for the investor. We examine the process of constructing a policy statement later in this chapter. Because investor needs changes over time, the policy statement must be periodically reviewed and updated. Okay? The process of investing seeks to peer into the future and determine strategies that offer the best possibility of meeting the policy statement guidelines. In the second step of the portfolio management process, the manager should study current financial and economic condition and forecast future trends. The investor's needs as reflected in the policy statement and financial market expectations will jointly determine 
investment strategy. Okay. The investors need, as reflected in the policy statement, and financial market expectation will jointly determine investment strategy. Economies are dynamic. They are affected by numerous industry struggles, politics, and changing demographics and social attitudes. Thus, the portfolio will require constant monitoring and updating to reflect the changes in financial market expectation. We got policy statement. Uh, the next one is determine strategies that support the statement. The third step of the portfolio management process is to construct the portfolio. With the investors policy statement and financial market forecast as inputs, the advisors implement the investment strategies and determine how to allocate available funds across the different countries, asset classes, and security. This involves constructing a portfolio that will minimize investors' risk while meeting the needs specified in the policy statement. The fourth step in the investment in the portfolio management process is the continual monitoring of the investor's needs and capital market conditions, and when necessary, updating the policy statement based upon all of this, the investment strategy is modified accordingly. Four steps, no four steps. A component of monitoring the process is to value portfolio performance and compare the relative results to the expectations and requirements listed in the policy statement. So you know the four steps, here they are. No, know that diagram, you will see it, or reference will be made to it. Okay, it's now about 11 o'clock. We've been at it for an hour. Let's take about a two minute break. Primarily because I'm going to get some water. My throat is a little bit dry. Do not log on. Go to the water cooler and we'll come right back. Okay, let's go to the water cooler. Okay, let's go to the water cooler. Okay,
Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, the last thing I gotta do. Hi guys, sorry about that, I'm back. Uh, moving on, designing an investment policy. Okay. These are the things, you got the four steps. Now they're going a little bit into it in terms of, okay, how do I design an investment policy? All right. Uh, before you should start, what are my investment objectives? All right. Uh, here, the objective talk about things like what is the return I expect, what is the risk factor I'm willing to tolerate, like some people are a little bit more risk tolerant than others, and so they may, you know, like I'll, I'll give you an example about myself. Uh, and, and you guys, you got, feel, feel free to laugh, okay? But just make sure when you laugh, you keep your microphone microphone muted. Uh, I always tell everybody uh, that I, I, I'm I'm conservative by name, and. Uh, it, 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 it has two ways that being conservative, yes, you could win. Being conservative, you could lose. Here's the one where I lower. I always tell people, like, they always come to me, Mr. Johnson, do you think the port or something like that is a good investment? I've learned now, rather than hurrying to say, oh, yeah, the port is a good investment. But I, I said, I don't know. I would have to look at you in totality to see whether it's a good investment for me. Take for instance, the port will probably be a very, very solid company. But I think part of the port, if you were buying stock from the port, not the bond, but the stock, they may not pay dividends for a certain period of time. So for an individual who is retiring and is going to be dependent upon the cash flow from their dividend, the port may not be a good investment for them. That's not a reflection on the financial strength of the port. That's a reflection on is the investment good for you in terms of meeting your objective 
if you're going to be dependent upon your investment income to support your life uh, because you're retiring now, or, or investment income to replace your normal employment income to maintain your lifestyle. Here's one where I lost. If somebody had come to me and asked me, uh, hey, no, no, I'll go even further. If the guy, I think his name was Zuckerberg, who on Facebook had come to me and tell me he can put that this platform out there, it's a social platform, and the way he can make money is the social platform is going to become so popular that advertisers are going to be paying him to advertise on this platform. I would give the boy the money to buy his medication because I would have swear he was off his medication. Who's laughing now? However, this, I got to get my winning. Cryptocurrency. <laughs> I always maintain the cryptocurrency is something I didn't understand. But I just figured cryptocurrency didn't have the fundamental underpinning to make to get this market going as high as it is. Yeah. FTX is a good example of that. That became a rather real cookie. Um, I just didn't see it. So again, I mean. But some people saw it, but they didn't understand the, her the inherent risks associated with cryptocurrency. All right. Uh, to me, at the time that Zuckerberg would have come to me, I would tell, tell you that was too risky, too, because I didn't understand social media and how that would have blossomed. Uh, other things to consider in terms of making your uh, investment objective and policy. Inflation, where's inflation going? As you know right now, the US, uh, Paula, you still there? Hello, hello, hello. Paula, are you still there? I'm still there. What is the big news about the US right up in now? In the investment side, what are they afraid of? Paula? Um, does that have anything to do with the interest rates? Okay, we just saw the interest rates went up because the Fed is trying to stop an inflationary spiral happening. And everybody would have heard about the collapse of the SVB bank. Um, and that was brought on by the Fed's increasing interest rates in reaction to trying to slow Mr. Down. Kenneth, sorry to interrupt you, but I think that interest, the interest rate is going up every month, the prime interest rate. But I feel like that could be an effect on us because customers can start paying out their loans because every month the interest rate go, going up. Like literally, I watched the interest rate went up from 3%, it's now to 8%. Okay, now, Monique, first of all, thank you for jumping in here. Man, I got you to sleep on me. <laughs> So now, what do you mean? What interest rate went up? The prime interest rate, the U.S. prime interest rate. So uh, if you have a, if you have a U.S. loan, a uh, U.S.D. dollar loan, you pay interest on the loan. So every month, I, well, I guess we we get our we get our notice to so send the customers to say that every other month the interest rate is go up. So we would send them an email to say, well, the interest rate went from, for example, from one percent to two percent, and I've watched that grow from literally 3% and it's now to 8%. Okay, I, hold on one second. I'm gonna say what you say here for a second. All right, uh, let me just see here. When you say your customers, I think if you have international customers or your local yeah. customers, I mean, well, well, local customers who deal with U.S. who you who deal with um the United States, who are business in the United States. Uh, yeah, I mean, interest rates are going up in the United States. If you look over the last several months, and it was stated that the Fed has been increasing, uh, the Fed rate, and it trickles on to the prime rate and everything, right? Uh by a quarter of a percent every month. 
Every, yeah, it, it, it's going up a quarter for true. What it's trying to do is slow down inflation. That, that's what the Fed is trying to do. Uh, to actually slow down inflation. Yes, as the rates go up, people are going to start borrowing because borrowing becomes more expensive. Yeah. I, uh, if, I don't think they could refinance their mortgages right now. This would be, but I, I think the people looking to get into mortgages are going to slow down. Yes. Uh, I don't think people are going to refinance their mortgage right now because if they refinance, they're going to refinance at a higher rate. So the, the, here it is now. The Fed is trying to curb inflation. And one of its money market tools is to put up the rates, to influence the rates to go up. Uh, I don't, Renitra, does that answer your question? It does. All right. So, yes, as you can see, it, it has a triple on effect. So, uh, I, I read the inflation, although most retail clients will need some degree of inflation protection, the extent will vary. A retired person with a long time, long time horizon and the goal of using the portfolio to generate income would be very concerned about what the purchasing power of the cash flow from the portfolio will be. Another person using short-term trading strategies and interested in maximizing maximization of capital gain, they concentrate less on this particular factor. So you see, again, inflation or the concern for the inflation again varies depending upon where you are in your life cycle, what is your growth, and so forth. So a retired person who has a set amount of income. They would be very concerned about inflation because as prices go up, one thing ain't a change the amount that they can get from the income. And, the, and ergo, their purchasing power will go down. Right below that is time horizon. Then, how long oh, are you giving yourself to achieve these objectives? I don't know. Liquidity. What type of liquidity do you need in case you need to get out of these things? So all of these things go into structuring uh, a portfolio to meet objective taxation. What tax brackets are you in? Am I going to buy this security and hold it until I retire then when I finally get my investment out? I'm, I'm being taxed at a lower rate. I mean, that doesn't affect us as much as it may affect international clients. Like you have things like the, you know, like the type of pension plans and so forth like that. Uh, what constraints are there? Constraints provide some discipline in the fulfillment of a client's objective. Constraints, which may loosely be defined as those items which may hinder or prevent investment managers from start satisfying the client's objectives are often not given the importance they deserve in the policy formation process. Perhaps this is because the objectives are more confronting. Perhaps this is because object objectives are a more comforting concept to dwell on than the discipline of constraint. Right here in our environment, when you sit down. With an investor, particularly if, it, if it's a Bahamian investor, what's one of the major constraints that we have? Kendra. What's all you? What's all you there? Anybody else? Meet 
The, no, I haven't heard from Gwinnett. 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 Hi. Hi, how are you? Good, yourself? I'm good, thank you. Gwinnett, I'm a CFP, a Certified Invest International Financial Planner. If you had a client that is the Hanya, and you were helping them construct their portfolio and their objectives, we read, read through some stuff, and the client is telling me what all they want to do. What is one of the major constraints that a Bahamian investor would be faced with in terms of forming their portfolio? Um, following their portfolio? In form, no, in sorry? Their portfolio objectives and what they're going to invest in. What is one of the major constraints that the Bahamian investor would face? Can't hear you too clearly, sir. Yeah, I oh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. And for a Bahamian investor, when they get to formulating their portfolio objectives and what are they going to invest in, what is one of the major constraints that they're going to face in terms of their ability to invest in various products? Well, from my understanding, they would, well, from Bohemian investors, they don't understand what is there in the market. Even though you give them the product, you would have to go into details to say, um, like a market, a money market or something like that. Their constraints would be understanding what information is presented to them. That's a good one, financial literacy. Yes. Financial literacy, the level of their financial literacy, that's one. The investment knowledge. That's correct. But give me something else that all behaviors, whether they have financial knowledge or not, what is the one constraint that they have no control over? I'm looking for something specific. Is that they don't have yes. No, no, wait, one at a time, Dimitri. Go ahead, Dimitri. I, I didn't hear I didn't hear that. I, I was asking, is it the options that they have, the amount of options um, they, they would have to invest in? You're getting wrong, but what, there's something specific that limits the amount of options they have. Cash. Say that again. Cash. No. Let me let me stop. Exchange control. Oh. Notice I said that face Bahamian investor. Yeah. Would that be regulators? When you say exchange control, you mean central bank? That's correct, sir. Yeah. Okay. So, That's I mean, I, I have a, a, a very direct question. So, um, I mean, you, you're talking about this and you're kind of giving us a, little, a lot of knowledge, right? Uh, would you advise everyone in this class to look at, you know, investing not only locally, but let's just say um, externally? You mentioned earlier about Facebook and the, and the price of stocks. And I read something um, very interesting stating that if you had invested in Apple when it was at $22 per share, um, $1,000 would actually be valued $1.6 million today. Would you... Do you think from a professional and financial standpoint that it's worth the risk to, let's just say, invest maybe $500 today to possibly have $2.5 million in 10, 20 years? Dimitri, I, I mean, if you put the question like that, uh, I mean, anybody say, yeah, if I can invest $500 today, and I, no, I say possibly. I say possibly. I mean, I, 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 I asking you based on what you're seeing in the market and how investments are going. I know one of the things with crypto is, is everybody be, everybody bringing out their own coin. So people buying these things at one cent a share and two cents a share, hoping it takes off. So it's more, you have more like investment schemes nowadays versus where back in the day. You let, actually let, let, let's put it this way. Let me tell you the fact that I know. I will tell you, if you have an interest in investing overseas, here are the facts. Number one, 
if you are going to buy investment dollars from the center, yes, you are going to have to buy those investment dollars, I think, at a 5% discount. In other words, if you were to buy, say, if you want to take out $100, If you wanted to take out a hundred dollars, if you would go to a central bank and say, I want a hundred dollars of investment dollars, they're going to give you $95. So you done lost five percent to begin with. On top of that, you got some exchange control you're going to have to pay to buy a US dollar. So you then lost 5%. You're not going to get that 5% back until you finally bring the funds back on shore. Number two, you're going to have to pay exchange control, which you're not going to get. You're going to have to pay exchange control going out and coming back in. So then wait the US dollars, then the US dollars back to be there. Third of all, most investment houses to which you can invest with a brokerage account require you to open up a portfolio with a minimum of $250,000. So once you can get over those hurdles and it's okay with you, so first of all, any investment, any investment that you participate in gotta reap you more than the 5%. Plus any other additional costs associated with it. Now, can you afford to put to put two hundred fifty thousand dollars in the US? Some people can. These are just some of the constraints. So, Dimitri, if I answered your question, I can't tell you whether it's a good thing you have to decide. I could just make you aware of the constraints. Yeah, so you did. I I, I keep my little five hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, like that man, you mashing my bones too. <laughs> <laughs> Just no sir, but that was very um, uh, that was very um, insightful. I didn't realize all of that. So no, no, no. like like Bonnet said, one of the constraints is financial literacy. You have to go and find out what are the constraints. You're making yourself now more literate in terms of. If this investor comes to you, Renata, that was very good. When you talk about financial literacy, increasing your financial literacy. Uh, and that goes to a whole bunch of uh, other constraints. But I just wanted to give us, because we work here in an exchange controlled environment, and we have that constraint. I mean, it may not be peculiar to, uh, to other jurisdictions. Having discovered, I'm, I'm moving on to major uh, investment objectives now. Having discovered the client's objectives and constraints, the next step is designing an investment policy is to summarize this information in terms of the three main major objectives of income capital gain and preservation of capital. It is these major objectives that will help determine the appropriate asset allocation for that price. Okay. Most people want everything they can have. They want to get that. They want to get that. Buy that stock that's going to give them a fantastic return without no risk. You know, Ronnie Butler said, Ronnie Butler song, everybody won, everybody won't get to heaven, but no one won there. <laughs> that might be, there is no such thing. So you got to determine, if you want the greatest reward, there's going to be the higher the risk. That risk does involve that your capital or your initial investment, maybe you wrote it. 
One major objective is to have some assurance that the initial capital invested will, will largely remain intact. If this is the main concern among the three major objectives, the client is effectively saying that regardless of whether a small, large, or nil return is generated on the capital, the manager should try to avoid erosion of the amount initially involved. So what you're trying to tell them, my brother, here's my hundred dollars. I want you to tell me to do nothing fancy with this. I guess I can need this in five years. Make sure my hundred dollars is there. I mind what you put it in, just don't put it in money. So it's going to come in five years. You telling me, well, you know, this investment I got into, it didn't work out the way I was. <laughs> But if, it did, but if it did wake up, well, I was going to have you a million dollars in the problem is it didn't wake up. And my hundred dollars gone now. So you failed me. Income. This major objective refers to regular series of cash flows from a portfolio, whether in the form of dividend, interest, or some other form, and is a broader definition and the basic minimum income referred to as a finished gift. Okay. Here's your guy now. He is saying one of my objectives is the time I hit retirement age. I would have accumulated enough in investment assets, but from my investment assets. I will have income, annual income generated to me of $70,000 to $100,000 a year. I'm now 30 years old. So over the next 35 years, till I hit 65, that is our major objective to build my investment portfolio with the view that it will generate income to me either in the form of dividend, interest, or some other form that will accumulate that interest will total seventy dollars to $100,000 a year, because that's what I'm going to need to maintain my standard of living when I retire. Capital gain. Uh, some people are very interested. Uh, Dimitri, going back to your example, if I invest this $500 in seven years from now, the stock been going up in price, and it's worth 1.5. You know, some people who want who want that type of capital gain, they're willing to take the risk associated with that one of the risky types of investment. Capital gain is a term related to increase in capital due to sales proceeds being higher than cost basis. That is selling something for more than a cost. Uh, here, the emphasis is on security selection and market timing, and generally is a trade off against preservation of capital. Capital gain is a major objective that includes risk, return, market timing, and emotional consideration. I that as well. Okay, so now you are the building blocks of the policy. You know what this guy is like. You know what his constraints are, you know what his risk tolerance are. Let's get down to meat and potatoes. Investment policy statement. Here, this is where you really take all of those objectives and everything you've learned and you translate it into the action item. This is what we can do. Ideally, the objective and constraints, I do not even the mind with stars are written down uh, in a formal document called an investment policy statement. This document forms the basis for the agreement between the manager and the client and is in effect the manager's job description. Policy statements can be either elaborate or quite simple. 
would most cover the objectives and the strength of the policy, a list of acceptable securities, and a list of prohibited securities. as well as the method to be used for performing appraisal, setting the asset mix. The next step in the asset allocation process is to determine the appropriate balance among the selected asset classes. This means when you go to the food store, I can buy so many, or I can spend so much dollars on meats, I can spend so many dollars on fruits, and I can send so many dollars on, I, I, I guess, bathroom or any money. So you got asset class there. That doesn't tell you within that meat where I can buy steak, hamburger, or whatever. Doesn't tell you in the produce where I can be, I can have beans or lettuce, tomatoes, uh, or some other thing. Again, in the bathroom or, or the household cleaning product, it doesn't tell you how much of that total amount that you spend on bathroom cleaning thing, you get getting a broad category. So here, we're looking at this this way. A guy, well con conservation, meaning capital protection, okay? He is gonna be more inclined to have an asset class in the broad category resembling here which you see here. Fixed income, probably 70%. And bond, you don't have erosion of capital normally. Uh, so they are sort of like preservation of capital, unlike equity where the stock market goes up and down and so forth. Equity is 15%. Ultra short fixed income or your cash portion is 15%. Ultra conservative. <clears throat> All right, and income, again, income may be, okay, I want a little bit more than just conservation of, 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 of capital. I want this to give me some income. So I'm willing to go a little bit more and put a little bit more in equity where I may get some capital gain based upon the change in the equity prices. So you reduce your fixed income, you increase your equity a little bit more, you're willing to take that ride in order to gain a little bit more income. Balance growth. I want a, a, a fixed spread between assets and equities. Notice how cash remains about the same throughout all these scenarios. So there you have the different scenarios. Of course, the ultimate one is the market growth where most of it <laughs> is generated what equity you really roll in the dice there. All right. Uh, so again, everything is important. The, the main thing is trying to determine not what you want. You are there to give advice, maybe that is blatant to you. But what is really you're trying to determine what really is what is it that the client really wants? What what is, how do I structure this the best to the need of the client? Now. Use completed portfolio management. The next step is uh, the law, economic law of supply and demand, and everything like that. Let me see something else. Okay, uh, let's see, uh, supply and demand, economic, this is very basic stuff. Let's see if we can go through the basics of supply and demand. 
I think everybody is basically on board. Uh, supply and demand is perhaps one of the most fundamental concepts of the economic, and it is the backbone of a market economy. Demand refers to how much quantity a product or service is desired by buyers. The quantity demanded is the amount of product amount of product people are willing to buy at a certain price. The relationship between price and quantity demanded is known as the demand relationship. Supply represents how much the market can offer. The quantity supplied refers to the amount of a certain good, a certain the amount of certain good producers are willing to supply when receiving a certain price. The correlation between price and how much of a good or service supply is to the market is known as the supply relationship. Price, therefore, is a reflection of supply and demand. The relationship between demand and supply underlie the forces behind the allocation of resources. In market economy, there are theories. Demand and supply theories will allocate resources in the most efficient way possible. How? Let us take a closer look at the law of demand and the law of supply. Without reading for, further, who can give me, who is willing to go there and tell me what is the law of demand? Candace. Candace, are you there? Candress. Candress. Ms. Alton, are you there? Yes, I'm here. What is the law of demand? Are you familiar with that term? To some degree. All right. Why don't you take a start of it? Um, <laughs> from a glance, I'm reading it says all other factors remain equal. The higher the price of the good the less the people will demand that good? That's right. And the, and the mirror of that, the lower the price, the more demand it, right? That's the law of demand. There is, a, there is an inverse relationship between price and demand. The higher the price, the less demand it. The lower the price, the more demand it. Simple as that. So having said that, Dimitri, give me the law of supply. Mr. Dimitri. Yes, he is not there. How about you, Ms. 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 Ronette? Can you give me the law of supply? Hi. Hi. Well, are you willing to help me out in today? And the voice getting tired now, and give me the oh. look of supply. Uh, it's, I'm only reading what it has here. I'm not familiar with these laws of the demand market. supply, mm -hmm. but it, what it states is the quantity that will be sold at a certain price. Uh huh. Uh huh. Unlike the law of demand, the supply relationship shows an upward slope. Meaning, I guess the price will always, not well, always, but will increase. Let's make this person. Let's make this person the person who will buy the goods for the price of the good. All right. You have a certain amount. You see where uh, super value selling tomatoes, uh, two cents a tomato. Okay? Mm -hmm. If, if you had a dollar and you could buy the tomatoes for two cents, what are you going to do? Get as, get as much tomatoes as possible with my dollar. 
Okay. Suppose now next week they go up to seven cents a tomato. What do you do? Do the same thing. The, 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 the most the market would say, no, 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 tomato too expensive now. Mm -hmm. I can buy less tomato to my dog. I may shift to buy something else. I may only buy the 50 cents of tomatoes in my daughter. I got to look for something else that's tomatoes too down the fence in that. Oh, you mean like that? Okay, understand. You understand? So you, I understand what you're saying, but when you're saying that to Bahamian, you know, we can maximize our dollar. Yeah, but you got choices. You only got this dollar. No, but then you got to say it as in, I can go to this super value out west and I can spend that tomatoes, I'm going to buy that two tomatoes or 50 cents for that tomatoes down there versus I'm traveling out east or central that I can spend that two cents in the central area and get maximized my dollar. Fair you understand enough. what I mean? Fair enough, mom. I accept that. I accept <laughs> that. And thank you for giving me a better example. <laughs> now, let's look at it from the supply point of view that you're looking at it from the buyer's point of view. Now, let's look at it as if you're the person supplying the tomatoes. Suppose you got a piece of property, you can go tomatoes, cucumbers, lettuce, and some other thing. All of a sudden now, last week, they were supplying, people were, there was a lot of people supplying the tomatoes, the price of the tomatoes was two cents. So you say, buddy, look here, I only get date, I only can put in 20 bushels of tomatoes. I gotta go some other crop. Look over here, cucumbers selling now at seven cents. So I can put some, I can put a little, little bit more money towards cucumbers. All of a sudden now everybody wants tomatoes. Uh there was a, 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 a pesticide bug. However, it would didn't affect your farm. So your tomatoes is good all of a sudden. Tomatoes now you can sell in the marketplace for seven cents. What you can do in the sun? Go next. Hello, hello. Yeah, what you can do? Use the supplier of tomatoes now. Well, I'm gonna go to the market with the two percent, the two 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 cents. No, tomatoes done going up from two cents to oh to seven cents. Yeah, what you can do? Well, I can try and get my profit out of the seven cents as in sell it to the store that no, you sell it when you're selling, you sell to the lowest bidder so that you can get more. No, now you are the supplier. You are the supplier. See, there's two sides to this. There's the law of demand, which you talked about when you were buying. What about the law of supply when you are supply when you supply it? So it's the amount that I'm supplying to the store. Well, you well, let me the concept is this. I can devote more of my resources to growing tomatoes. Uh -huh. and cut back on growing another fruit or a vegetable because I could get more for the neighbor. Okay. You understand what I'm saying? Right. Now, so you, you, you've, you've seen it on both sides. So the law of demand has an, it, it states that demand has an inverse relationship with price. The law of supply states that the, the relationship between price and supply is, I, I don't know, converse, meaning they the two. The higher the price, the higher the amount of black. The lower the price, the lower the amount of black. Inverse converse. Oh no, let me put it here. I don't want to say converse. Inverse and direct. Okay. There is a direct correlation between price and the amount of drive. 
The higher the price, the more supply. The lower the price, the less supply. Direct correlation. That's the law of supply. Now, however, so what you have going on in the marketplace is like a tug of war. You got consumers who want more goods for less price. You got suppliers who want to supply more goods for higher price. So at some point in time, those market forces can come together and they're going to agree on a set price. That is when they call the market being in, in equilibrium. That is the what they look, what they call it. The equilibrium price. This is the price at which uh, the agreed upon price by which buyers are willing to buy and sellers are willing to sell. That's the market equilibrium price. All right, uh, I'll leave the reading to you. Okay, that's going to do it for us for the day because the next thing is, is uh, finding stock valuation, and that's pretty important. And we've covered a lot of information today. Uh, uh, are there any questions? Um, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Reference to the calculation for uh, the a little bit more. Sorry, um, in reference to the calculation for like the put and call option, is I have a lot of questions like that on the app. Yes, I'm not gonna give you a put and call calculation. It's hard enough. Okay. Trying to figure out. What a put in, what a call in. You, you heard how you stumbled, you have said, no, I, I'm not going to take you. I may ask you, well, what is the strike price? Or if you have an option, like you buy an option, APC option, uh, uh, January uh, strike price, so and so, what does it mean? Okay. Options are very, very difficult things to understand. I, I just don't, I just want you to have a concept of it. Um, I'm a no definition guy. I, I, I like, I don't expect, I would expect more for you to have a better working knowledge of the time value of money for an option. Hey, thank you. Right. Any other questions? Take it the other questions. You don't have to be. What can I expect on the exam? That type of thing. I will reiterate in the class. What is my cardinal rule? I told you guys about how to sit this exam. The Sanders, what did I get? What, what is the advice I gave you on the onset in terms of taking this exam that is presumably an open book exam? Um, I think you said to do as much as you can do and then study the key areas that you don't are that you're not familiar with. Come on, that ain't what I said. The minute you tell her what I said about taking uh, up. Anyone, anyone tell you me. said answer the questions that you do know, um, and then allow yourself to come back where you may have a little more time for the ones that you really don't know the answer to. That is my saying advice having sat this exam. Uh, Ms. Sanders, I, I hope I wasn't rude in my response to you. Uh, you, 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 you. You understand what I'm saying, Ms. Sanders? I'm not talking about how you study for the exam. I'm talking about when you get in there and they say go. Yes, yes, I understand. Okay, then go through, look at the question, answer what you could from the top of your head. 
Because what you do not want to do is leave some crumbs on the table that you can very easily answer for drugs if you didn't get here. You are going to be under pressure to finish this exam in, the, in, the, in a lot of time. Take that from me. Will we have access to any past papers? Uh, I think Miguel will probably supply you guys you guys with a mock exam, but he's going to do that after the whole, all of the modules are finished because he doesn't want to get too distracted in terms of trying to answer these questions or get all blown out of proportion over uh, what over things material that you haven't covered with yet. But I mean, as opposed to questions, at time value, y'all could go onto the internet and download <clears throat> and download practice problems on time value. Repeat that, sir. I mean, I went the, the sample problems that I found on the time value of money, future value, present value, uh, uh, uh thing of uh. The equal the annuities and everything. I found them online. There are a bunch of questions online you can test yourself with just going in and getting sample digestion. And I, I would imagine you would be able to do that on a lot of the other modules, like what is the will? How do you? Uh, example of questions on will, it's wills and so forth. You can go online to do that. So to say, <clears throat> I understand you may want to mark it down to understand how these people ask their questions. But in terms of testing your knowledge, the internet is, if you all got it so easy these days, I wish when I was doing that, and I, I had the internet that I could go get some questions for the doc. Um, anything else? Okay, guys, you have my number. Uh, next week, we're going to wrap up and please look for anything else that you do not want to, that you want to have questions with. Uh, Ms. Oden, I'll probably go back and work a couple of those questions next week on time value. Sort of like a review. So, anyone else who has any questions on any problem or on any questions that gave them a problem, we can do it next class because I'm sure we're going to have some extra time next class. All right. So, having said that, guys, enjoy the rest of your weekend. And thank you very much for participating. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Okay.